the delay there were some technical difficulties which we have to overcome thank you so much for your patience so we can we can so um, we thank you so much for all the speakers and the participants for joining us for today's session on cell wafer and concentrated solar technologies we have extraordinary speakers with us who are very experienced in solar manufacturing especially in the areas of cell wafer and concentrated solar so uh, without wasting your time I'm, i'm i would like to invite our first speaker uh, mr rajesh jain ceo of high temperature solar technologies who is a mechanical engineer for 25 years who is providing excellent solutions to the processing industry Six years ago, he started this company, High Temperature Solar Technologies, to solve problems in solar thermal technologies. So, Rajesh Jain, sir, please, uh, I, I welcome you to join the presentation. The presentation will be up in a minute. Can everyone see the presentation? Yeah. Mr. Jain, the floor is yours. Mr. Jain, you are in mute. Please unmute yourself. Sorry. Uh, greetings from Pune. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Rajesh Jain, CEO of High Temperature Solar Technologies. At the outset, we have to thank Invest India and the Young Dynamic team at Agni. Thank you for this opportunity. Special thanks to Mr. Gautam Raj for insisting that we participate in this forum. As the name suggests, we have little to do with photovoltaic technologies. For the next 10 minutes, we will be digressing from this subject we will be speaking about an indian invention a new family of solar concentrators that will impact a lot of thought processes gata i cannot change the slide yeah thank you here we have one of the inspirations that has and our thought scholars in such institutes are using large industrial grade technologies mm -hmm. to conduct experiments in high temperature chemistry this paper by the legendary john margrave of the rice university says it all in the underlined portions yeah the possibilities of this approach are well illustrated by the three laws of high temperature chemistry at high temperatures everything reacts with everything the higher the temperature the faster the reaction the product may be anything with an infinity of species available at these temperatures the golden age of chemical synthesis is probably in the future these experiments cover a whole range of spectrum right from mitigation of greenhouse gases to synthesis of nanomaterials to testing new materials commercial viability for these experiments has been envisaged if solar concentrators can provide such high temperatures as of date a very limited number of highly specialized research institutes are carrying out such field trials these field trials have thrown up serious challenges in respect of the limitations in con in solar concentration technologies for the last 6 years we have been working to provide solutions to such challenges take us on the next slide please we have invented the fresnel lens tunnel technology this technology generates temperatures and power densities that have been considered impractical in a commercial solar concentrator this technology enables convergence of multiple foci lenses what we are seeing here 
is the convergence of multiple foci on a specimen target being viewed through a welding screen. Yes, Gautam, the next one, please. Validated and de-risked this technology. We have built a one kilowatt proof of concept and created temperatures above 2,200 degrees C with heat rates of degrees a second. We have also incorporated a master system for conveying shaped solids and gases through such temperatures. The next one, Gautam, please. Here we have a photograph of the actual irradiation taking place along the pyrometer readings. Thank you. The next one. Change over, please. Yeah, thank you. We are now looking up to scale up to a minimum viable product, a seven kilowatt experimental solar furnace. Designs for this are in place. Go to the next one. We know there are large stature startups that are focusing on both development of the solar technology and the chemistry application. Synhalion and Haliogen are two such stalwarts in this field. They are being funded by the lakes of Bill Gates, the Italian giant ENI. We would like to mention here that all these setups have a modular design. This helps in reducing the re-radiation losses. That's next one, please. The most important component for our scale up is the availability of large lens. For the seven kilowatt and 50 kilowatt plant, a ballpoint figure for manufacturing a five meter by five meter segmented lens has also been obtained. In future, a similar 10 meter by 10 meter segmented lens can be made available for half a megawatt. The next one, Gautam, please. Thank you. Hundreds of high temperature chemistry processes are being researched in the academia. We present two such potential uses for the technology. The first one is the solar thermal cracking of landfill or biomass process to produce hydrogen and solid carbon. The energy requirement for this reaction is 75.6 kilojoules per mole. But the most important challenge for economic viability of such a process is the reaction temperature. Just go through the underlying portion. Methane conversion of 90% was obtained at a reaction wall temperature of 2133K and a residence time of 0 0.01 second. At 1923K, methane conversion decreased to 35%. That talks a lot about it. The next one, please. Here we have an Excel sheet where the possible theoretical hourly outputs have been calculated. A seven kilowatt setup can produce 1.3 kilograms of hydrogen per hour. A 50 kilowatt can provide around 9.4 kilograms per hour. Similarly, a 125 and half megawatt can provide 23 and 94 kilograms of hydrogen per hour. These are just theoretical without the efficiencies. Thank you. Welcome. Next one. It is noteworthy to mention that what the scholars are attempting has already been carried out in the industry. This website snapshot of Birla Carbon depicts their six step carbon black manufacturing process. They're using a similar method to produce a special grade of carbon black from natural gas. The underlying portion clearly mentions something like that. And sometimes natural gas are fed into the reactor in tightly controlled amounts. These reactor reactions occur in temperatures 
up to 1800 degrees Celsius and can take less hundredth of a second. It's the same thing that what what the att attempts by the scholars. The next one, Gautam, please. Uh, now to the potential second application. We have received this uh, unusual request from a student studying crystallography in an American university. Their group wants to use the manufactured proof of concept to fuse minerals to emulate the Vernoli process. Now we didn't know, we just said this. The next one, Gautam, please. The vernoli process is used to manufacture synthetic rubies, emeralds, and sapphires at temperatures above 2000 degrees C. The underlying portion clearly mentions this. Using an oxy flame blow pipe and producing crystals drop by drop, much like a stalagmite, at temperatures greater than 2000 degrees centigrade. We believe such processes should be possible. Next one, Gautam, please. We strive to provide multitude of research opportunities in universities and academia by making field testing in high temperature chemistry a routine subject. We are in the business to sell service and maintain such equipment for the academia, research institutes and chemistry oriented startups. This will enable them to concentrate on the chemistry applications and not worry about the solar concentrator and its peripherals. We are seeking traction from policymakers in India to provide India with its first solar furnace at IIT Jodhpur. We are the only ones supplying this. Sir. Finally, ladies and gentlemen of the Zaga August House, thank you for your patience. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jain, for a wonderful presentation. I'm sure um, uh, advanced high temperature solar technologies would be a game changer for India. On that note, uh, I would like to uh, uh, talk about uh, our next speaker, Dr. Ayodhya Tiwari of Swiss Federal Laboratories for Material Science and Technology, commonly called as EMPA. And he is also the founder of Flissum, a spin off company in thin film photovoltaics. He has a mission to develop next generation high performance thin film solar cells. Sir, it's an honor to have you here. I invite you to start your presentation. Uh, your presentation would be just up in a minute, second. Next slide. Thank you very much for inviting me and introducing me. Uh, namaste, greetings of the day from Zurich. I will be talking about flexible lightweight thin film photovoltaics. And uh, basically, before I go into the technology, just on a very basic level, I like to say it's like a fruit of basket where you have apple, oranges, banana. So something similar is for the photovoltaics. There are various materials, various technologies. Uh, they offer some advantages, some opportunities. And what I will be talking about is an innovative solar module manufacturing process together with a production plant. Why we say innovative? Because this is very rare is not one of those hundreds of plants which you can see anywhere around the world. It's uh, for manufacturing lightweight thin film polar modules. So these modules are quite different from commonly available silicon wafer based on thin film modules on glass. And they offer several opportunities where some traditional te 
technologies may have some constraints. So as introduced, uh, my name is Ayodhya Nathiwari. I'm having the laboratory for thin film and photovoltaics. I'm in the field of photovoltaics for close to 40 years, thanks to be introduced by my uh, Guruji, Professor K. L. Chopra, where I did my IIT uh, from IIT Delhi. Then I moved to Switzerland and I established a research lab and we developed a technology uh, and ended up uh, founding a company, Leeson, uh, in Switzerland. Next slide, please. So, the Fleesum company is a spin out from ETH Zurich, which is Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, known for about 21 Nobel uh, laureates coming from the institutes. And it's uh, one of the top ranking technical universities in the world. And uh, the company was established in 2005, and it has an exclusive research partnership from EMPA, which is Swiss Federal Laboratory for Material Science and Technology, and I'm having the lab there. And Fleesum Company has developed the technology, not only the processes, but also the equipment. Mr. Joseph? Hi. So can you hear me now? Yes, I can. I think you were just on mute. I could not unmute my I could not unmute my, my phone. Okay, okay, that is fine. I think that's because um I have the control for this. Okay. So uh should we start? Yes, we can start. Okay. So welcome and I'm um, we are proud that we have the opportunity to present our uh, new developments here in this conference. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, the uh, organization team. I want to talk a little bit about the developments in the advanced equipment for high volume production, which is used for PERC and technologies beyond PERC. Next slide, please. Uh, I, just a short outline of my talk. It's first I will talk, uh, uh, give a brief introduction to central therm. Then I look what what is the market demand, the equipment. Then I will discuss in detail the equipments, PCVD and diffusion, and give a short summary. Next, please. Uh, central therm is a leading supplier uh, in in the. The solar cell equipment and production solutions for crystalline solar cells. We are active in India for more than 35 years, supplying our customers in semiconductor and solar industry. Our experience in solar is more than 40 years and in turnkey solutions more than 15 years. And we have a high number of installed production lines and equipments. We are about uh, 1,500 furnaces for PCVD and about 1,000 furnaces for diffusion, which are out there in the market. And we are the expert for thermal and deposition equipment for solar cell technology and solar cell production lines. When we look, we had uh, originally the solar industry started from semiconductor, then it separated and get more into the high volume throughput. What I always mention is semiconductor does the best for every wafer. Solar does the necessary for the maximum amount of wafers. And what we now profit from is our semiconductor experience is with high efficiency solar cell applications, more and more semiconductor problems are also moving over to solar cell manufacturing. We have also a group of uh, partners in the research community like Fraunhofer, ISFH, ISC, and the University of Constance. And we are always looking to find a partner in India for the further developments. Next slide, please. When we look at our references, oh, it's a little bit 
something happened to it. Uh, we have all the major on the left side, all the major uh, Indian manufacturers are our customers and we have supplied them with equipment and they are using this to be successful in the market. On the right side, you see another as the other refer uh, selected references. Continue, please. Now I will have shortly a look at the market. And when we look there at the IRTP roadmap, which is a picture of the opinions of the major manufacturers in the world and also some equipment makers. And then we see for the next 10 years, the market will be dominated by Perk, Pearl, Pert, and Topcon cells. This is a group of technologies that uses a very similar equipment set for manufacturing. This means it's also, that's why we focus on this area. And this is also why it is so dominant because it's the most cost-effective manufacturing, which is currently known. Next, please. But what's more important, what's the most important thing is that we, that, oh, that's not really working, uh, that the market is driven by cost per kilowatt hours. We have to do everything to bring this number down. And this means, especially because more and more solar products are sold by PPAs. Next, please. Now I will look at in detail at the equipment development. When you look, when I just look for PCVD from 2007 to 2019, we have an increase in equipment throughput of about 10 times. This means upgrading a 10 year old equipment is not an eco economic solution anymore, especially as the wafer size has also grown in the meantime. Our tool is an industry standard. It's based on the experience over this long period of uh, installation, manufacturing, and production. It's a proven workhouse and still a benchmark for competitors when they launch new equipment. Uh, the PCVD system can be used for PERC, Topcon, as it can uh, de de deposit all the major layers that are needed in this technology from aluminum oxide to nitride down to polysilicon. Wafer size range is uh, M6, M10, and M12 as a standard. This means 166, 182, and 210. Other sizes are available optionally as they are in this range. Next, please. When we look at the machines, the, on the left side, the C plasma is a machine which can handle 156 to 166 millimeter wafers. That's a machine you are quite aware of and uh, you well know. Uh, it has a 352 millimeter boat and five tubes. The next generation is the plasma X, which can handle 166, 182, and 210 millimeters. So it's safe for the next wafer sizes. It uses 10 tubes. And from the boat size for 166, it's still the 352, 294 for 182, and 240 for uh, 210. We have also a very low consumption of TMA in the systems, which is less than 6 milligram per wafer. And when you look at the cost of ownership, if I set the basic system to 100%, you can save with the Plasma X about 20, 10 to 20%. And when we go to the next size, which is a, it's a bigger system, which can handle 416, 315, 288 wafers, depending on M6, 10, and 12. And there you can save between 20 and 30%. Next, please. Here you see just what this means in megawatt when I take our standard processes of the machines on top the small one. 
which had about 150 megawatts in our logs, and the Plasma X about 300 and 300 megawatts. And this is quite independent of the wafer size as the area of the graphite plates in the graphite boat are uh, quite similar for the different wafer sizes. And if you go to the Plasma XL, the next extension, then we run about 350 megawatts. Next. When we look at nitrite, it's a quite similar machine. It has about 10% higher capacity compared to the Alox. This is because the uh, stack process for Alox nitrite is about 10% longer in pro processing time. Next, please. This means we have with a new tool set we have now established in the market, uh, already up to M12 wafer size, which means 210 millimeters. We have a higher throughput, a high process flexibility, easy to implementation of new process requirements, quite important to secure the in your investment. Higher uptime because of high quality components, special exhaust separation concept, which will save several amount of money on the handling of the waste gas, especially for TMA, silane, and ammonia and nitrous oxide, a lower total consumption of all these materials, and you have reduced manpower as you have less machines, lower maintenance cost, and a reduced number of furnaces and wafer handling systems. So the saving is not only on the equipment side, it's also on the handling side, so that in total you get the lowest capex when you look at the less amount of equipments plus the exhaust treatment concept. And you have a reduced floor space, so you can bring a significantly higher amount of capacity on the same area. Next, please. Now we move to diffusion. Here you see it's even more severe from a diffusion furnace 2007 to 2020. We have about an 18 times higher capacity on the machine. It's also the same machine, basic design with an industry standard now available for atmospheric and low pressure processes, proven workhouse, still benchmark for competitors. And the diffusion processes that are the standard is phosphorus, boron diffusion, oxidation, and annealing. And wafer size similar to the PCVD M6, M10, and M12, which means 166, 182, and 210 millimeters. Next, please. When we look here, it's, a, it's quite similar design. First, we when we look at the machine, you already know, with 156 to 166 millimeter wafers, the C-diff, which has about 1,000 wafers per tube. We move to the DIFF-X, which has about once, uh, 1,600 wafers and 10 tubes for 166 to 182 millimeter wafers. And if you go to two 10 millimeter wafers, we have 10 tubes, but we have only 12, 1,200 wafers in a boat. As a space, there's a bigger spacing required to compensate the depletion to the center of the wafer. When you look at the savings, you have also here a significant cost of ownership reduction. Next, please. When we look at the throughput, it's even more amazing. When the old machine had about 182 megawatt. Then we have, with the DIFX, we have about 600 to 700 megawatt throughput in one machine. And for the, this is all for the Pockel diffusion. If we look at the Boron diffusion, there's still only the five tube system. We have de developed a process for the 10 tube system. We had so far no request from any customer for these wafer sizes. Next, please. Summary here, same as in the PCVD, ready, the systems are ready for M, 
the wafer size is up to M12. We have a higher throughput, higher flexibility, higher uptime. Here we implement a POCL refill system just to get the systems more stable, to get the process variation smaller as it is required now for the newer high efficiency processes. Lower total consumption in POCL, reduced manpower, lower maintenance costs, and also the same. Less machines means less handlings, less tubing, everything. And the reduced floor space again helps to make, bring more capacity in the same space. Next, please. Now, let me come to a short summary. What we have, central therm is suitable for all equipment suitable for all cell technologies. Changes between technologies are require only small modifications. And this means the equipment lifetime is, is extended. This means your investment is, has a, is, can be used for a longer time. The standard processes are PERC with aluminum oxide, TOPCON with polysilicon, with PCVD poly on N-type, POLO, also polysync passivated contact, using, this is a misprint, LPCVD polysilicon on P-type. Then we have the bison N-type bifacial cell and zebra and N-type bifacial IBC cell. And there are a lot of other modifications of these processes around. High process flexibility, easy implementation of new requirements, and our processes are free of IP violations. We have the lowest total cost of ownership and the lowest floor space requirements. Next, please. Just when we look in the NRL uh, chart with the highest efficiencies, then you see there is two red marks, are the red dots are a little bit disturbed. We have the ISFH with the Polo, which is a lead, uh, has a lead in the efficiency, and we have the IFS, Fraunhofer, ESA, which is in the top corn in the lead. Next, please. And here, just the top corn cell, it's, used, it's, it's manufactured using our central therm PECVD system for polysilicon passivation. Next, please. And the, and the Polo cell is using our LPCVD polysilicon passivation for the high efficiency cells. Next, please. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, please feel free. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Uh, so I think we're just going to quickly move on um, to first solo. We have Mr. Kumar Rana, who's going to be presenting on... Sir, can you hardly understand you? Sorry? I could hardly understand you. Did you talk to me or...? No, sir, I was just saying thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to hand it over to the next presenter, who is from First Solar, uh, Mr. Kuntal Kumar Sharma, and he's going to be presenting on thin film technology. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kuntal Kumar Sharma. Uh, I'll be talking about First Solar's thin film technology, our product uh, capital value differentiation, manufacturing, and a brief insight into our uh, future roadmap. Go to the next slide. So First Solar is a multi-gigawatt thin film-based uh, solar panel manufacturer with 25 gigawatts of solar modules uh, shipped worldwide. Um, we have global footprints in USA, uh, Vietnam, and Malaysia, and the two R&D centers in, in uh, Ohio and California. We make cadmium telluride uh, thin film based solar panels, uh, cattle material system, and our manufacturing technology that goes into the making of the panels uh, is our key differentiator. Uh, we have weathered the ups and downs in the solar market by staying focused in our uh, balanced business model, uh, 
growth without compromising on liquidity and profitability. Uh, our long-term vision is to excel in technology and cost leadership, uh, leading the world's uh, sustainable energy future. Go to the next slide. This, uh, uh, the nameplate of our current modules are in the range of uh, 420 to 450 watts. Uh, these modules, they demonstrate uh, better temperature coefficient. Uh, they have uh, best in the industry, unmatched uh, spect spectral performance, uh, true tracking, and reducing soiling related performance losses. Go to the next slide. So the nameplate um, power at 25C in a controlled atmosphere is far removed from what the panel actually uh, sees in real life. In field, the panel is covered in dust, atmosphere has humidity that changes, uh, which changes the spectrum and the panel operating at temperatures also above, sometimes at above uh, 40C. As the resistance of the material increases at higher temperatures, so panel performance comes down. It's nowhere close to the label on the panel. Consider your car or scooter mileage uh, in a smooth, flat road with no port portals or traffic versus driving in a traffic in an Indian city. Um, mileage and performance are two very different things. So the graph here compares a first solar cattail panel at uh, standard uh, operating conditions and the efficiency as measured versus the actual power output that you see on the right under field-like conditions. And you can see the first solar module compares to other solar modules. Uh, and, and all of these comparisons are coming from solar module super loop providers. Uh, our technology development effort is to maximize um, the area under the curve to maximize energy. Uh, go to the next slide. So a quick overview of our technology evolution. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, First Solar developed and perfected a high throughput process uh, to apply device quality cattail semiconductor thin sheets of glass. Later in the decade, we optimized our manufacturing flow and fortified our supply chain uh, to beat the $1 per watt benchmark in 2009. Uh, next decade, uh, the team pivoted to focus on device stack uh, Cattle semiconductor quality, front contact and back contact um, uh, improvements followed as we broke device performance benchmarks every year. One reason First Solar was able to maintain leadership was its ability to translate lab results to pilot um, and NHVM in quick order. In 2017, for Solar uh, launched the a large farm factor series six panel, which retooled, uh, it retooled at factories in USA, Malaysia, and launched two new factories in Vietnam. Um, we ramped to six gigawatts in the next two years. As we examine competition in, in, in crystalline silicon space, um, monopark, bifacial, n-type, we are also pivoting to prepare the next round of device improvements, and and Cure is is a backbone of that. Go uh, to the next slide. A, a brief description uh, description of our uh, uh, Cure next gen uh, technology. Um, so, devices at the heart of a solar panel require controlled amounts of uh, certain elements called dopants. Uh, silicon uses boron, phosphorus, arsenic, etc. Uh, cattle has traditionally used copper. Uh, while copper is essential to make the device work, but it also plays a big role uh, in degradation in the field. Uh, First Solar recently uh, announced arsenic as a copper replacement doping. What makes it so exciting for us is the demonstration of a device that show little to no degradation and then high stress that emulates field. Um, technology development teams is currently, uh, they're pulling all stops uh, uh, to get into this, into manufacturing. And we truly believe this will be a paradigm shifting part. Uh, combine this with the NOCT performance uh, I discussed in the previous slides. Uh, we firmly believe that we have a product that will be the best in the marketplace for utility scale production. 
go to the next slide. So what about the future? Um, what do the physicists uh, say? Uh, crystalline silicon is limited to max efficiency based on fundamental material property limitation. Uh, cattail is not even close to it, um, close to its entitlement. Uh, we have a demonstrated material capability that gives us visibility to closer to 23 to 25 percent efficiency. Uh, in fact, silicon world is pivoting to thin films and evaluating strategies to marry thin film for silica, uh, with silicon using technologies like perovskites. Uh, we believe we are strategically, uh, strategically placed um, due to our know-how with thin films to exploit that better. Go to the next slide. So what does next decade hold for Cartel? As, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide, our effort in the next few years is to introduce and further improve our pure platform to reach its potential in the mid term. Uh, further, our advanced research team are diligently working towards the next frontier of cattle improvements to create a roadmap to bridge the gap of theoretical maximum. And, and, and that's what our, most of our efforts will be in, in, the next, uh, in, in the next decade. Go to the next slide. This slide shows a layout of our state-of-the-art manufacturing line. Uh, it's a 2.5 gigawatt production plant uh, housed under one roof, a fully automated, uh, connected layout, uh, deploying advanced process control, industry 4.0 standards, um, tightly controlled process, ensuring consistent quality and reliability of our product. And, and, and tool only capex in the low teens in terms of cents per watt. Uh, PCO glass is fed at one end, uh, which you see on the left uh, and, and uh, on the top left. And then within less than 4.5 hours, this layout will be churning out modules every 16 to 18 seconds. Um, for solar also recycles all its scrap uh, it generates in the factory and also offers these same facil uh, facilities to its customer at a normal price. So how does it compare uh, with crystalline value stream. Uh, multiple product development, 20 plus products, 100 plus bombs, multiple factories, increased variability and quality and reliability risk. Uh, even PV Tech says that the tier one uh, players, 40 to 80 percent uh, of their bomb is, not, uh, is only traceable uh, with their fragmented supply base, which has a greater risk profile. Go to the next slide. Please go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so we all get excited about uh, green energy. Um, it is easy to forget that most of the grid is still supplied by fossil fuels, which are necessary to support the base load. Uh, so let us see how thin film compares to crystal silicon energy payback. Um, for solar generates the energy that was used to produce them uh, in less than five months. That is four times faster uh, than monocrystalline. If you factor in the water consumption and, and recyclability, I'll let you decide what is truly green. Um, so overall, our sustainability scorecard bears uh, very well against our crystal silicon. And uh, that was my last slide. And I'll be open for questions in there. Presentation, uh, and now we're just going to move on uh, to the next speaker, who is Mr. Peter, and he is from IEAP, the PVPS from Austria, and he is going to be presenting on BIPE, the future. Uh, are you ready, Mr. Peter? Hello. Hi, I'm just going to hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy um, that the topic like BIPV can present in such a technology focused uh, session. Um, I'm Peter Illich. I'm a researcher at the University of Applied Sciences, Technicum Vienna. And in this function, I'm acting as the operating agent from uh, the task 15 from the International Energy PVPS. 
technolo technology collaboration program. Uh, next slide, please. When uh, talking about uh, building integrating integrated photovoltaics, um, we are talking about a multifunctional technology as a part of the building skin, enabling uh, not only the energy active uh, part of PV, the electricity production, but also uh, other functionalities um, for the building and the built environment, such as you can see in this slide here, um, such as providing shading or sun protection, um, heat and cold management, uh, weather protection, and above all, uh, PV uh, used as an aesthetic building design element and thus uh, enabling to increase the acceptance in a large scale uh, penetration of PV in the built environment. Next slide, please. So, BIPV, Building Integrated Photovoltaics, is on the one hand a building or construction product and at the same time an energy producer. So we are dealing with a technology that at least uh, serves uh, as a dual functional uh, uh, product. Um, and um, when talking about BIPV and BIPV modules and systems, um, we established uh, a certain definitions uh, that serve as basis for regulatory uh, frameworks uh, on an international level. Um, you can see uh, the, the picture of the publication from um, the IEA PVPS. Uh, what is important is that BIPV uh, and as a module uh, is um, and its dual duality and dual function multifunctionality is serving as, as an integrated part of the building. And if a BIPV product is dismantled or removed from a built uh, environment or from a building, it would have to be replaced by a suitable uh, construction uh, product. Next slide, please. Um, within the International Energy uh, Agency, uh, TCP of the photovoltaic uh, power systems program, um, we are working uh, on, on, on certain tasks um, together with in, in all uh, 27 countries uh, with the goal to enhance the international collaborative efforts uh, which facilitate the role of PV uh, as a cornerstone in the energy tr transition. Uh, next slide, please. So, one of the uh, tasks within the IEA PVPS uh, TCP is uh, the so-called Task 15, uh, where we are working on an enabling framework for the development of BIPV uh, with the objective to create an enabling framework that accelerates the penetration of BIPV products on the global market. Uh, next slide, please. Our approach um, is a value-added approach um, as uh, BIPV is related to both the electric uh, technology and also the building construction technology. Therefore, um, within task 15, we are dealing with topics related, uh, of course, to uh, PV technology itself, but also uh, with topics related to the building um, and in close collaboration with the building industry. So the scope uh, of, of our uh, initiative and our, our work uh, is covering uh, a many, many aspects on an interdisciplinary level. We are covering, of course, also example uh, buildings and best practice examples, new and existing buildings. We are dealing with uh, different PV technologies um, different uh, applications, as well as uh, scale difference from one family dwellings to large scale BIPV applications, uh, such as in offices and utility buildings. Uh, next slide, please. With uh, our enabling framework of task 15, we uh, aim to help stakeholders such as uh, from the building sector, the energy sector, 
but also from public, governmental, and financial sector, but also uh, from uh, R&D uh, institutes uh, all over the world to overcome technical and non-technical barriers uh, with regard to the implementation of BIPV uh, in the built environment. And uh, we develop uh, processes, methods, and tools uh, to assist them. Next slide, please. Who are we? We are uh, over 40 experts coming from about 17 countries uh, and different sectors, as I just mentioned, uh, such as uh, R&D, but also BIPV industry uh, partners are involved within Task 15. Uh, we have experts coming from the building sector, architecture, and uh, so on, um, uh, working together uh, on this aspect. Um, thank you. So uh, let's uh, get to the future. Um, BIPV allows us to redesign the world and integrate energy into our built environment and landscapes. Next slide, please. But why is it so important to talk about PV in the built environment? As we all know, uh, the building sector is responsible for a big part of global end use energy consumption and uh, direct and indirect CO2 emissions, uh, which uh, makes it uh, a very important topic to talk about. And as we all know, um, glo globally, there have been uh, or are many political statements and directives that have been moving further towards reducing the impact of buildings in the energy sector, uh, such as keywords like uh, zero energy buildings, communities, and cities. Next slide, please. This makes uh, PV in the built environment and built in the building sector itself um, not only the cause of, of a problem, but also a potential source of solutions via integrating PV in the built environment. Um, of course, also considering uh, um, the multifunctionality, energy active building envelopes, use of already built environment, or uh, self-consumption issues or uh, local generation of electricity close to consumers. Next slide, please. So the boundary conditions and initiatives uh, globally, they look very uh, promising uh, as, and they present a very promising background for the BIPV uh, market uptake. However, um, a major fraction of, of the potential for BIPV still remains unused, which uh, is 